watch this at night. Hey Curious Cats, my name is Sahara. Welcome to the True Crime channel. Let's get into it. I do apologize about the noise. My window is open because it's really hot right now in Paris and I'm a Stark. I love winter. I hate summer, so I have to open the window. Thank you to the person who suggested this case. It is so interesting and there's so much material on it. I'm actually making a two-part video, so this is part one and part two is going to come out next week. So yeah, let's get into it. We're going to start this case with Stephen Powell. Stephen Powell was born on December 1949 in Portland, Oregon. And this is where we dive into past trauma and troubled childhoods. First of all, Stephen grew up very poor. Later, he would tell friends that sometimes they barely had any food on the table. When Stephen was very young, one day his mother just packed up and left. She decided to leave her husband, the father of her four children, she just packed up and left and we don't know where. It doesn't matter. She just left. After a while, she reconciled with her husband. She moved back into the trailer because they lived in a trailer. But after a very short time, and Stephen was only seven at the time, his dad decided to do the exact same thing his wife did. He took advantage of his wife's absence. She had gone to visit her sister, and with the help of his parents, he took the kids and he left. Stephen will forever be haunted by this memory he has of his grandfather driving and he's in the back seat and he's asking him, where's mommy? And his grandfather replied, you're never going to see her again. Then he told him to shut up and he poured cayenne pepper in his mouth to make sure he would shut up. Stephen would remember this traumatizing event as a kidnapping. When later he would tell friends about it, he would use this word. He would say, I was kidnapped by my grandparents. I was abducted. So he would use that word when he told the story, but also when he would write songs about his childhood. Because you see, Stephen was very fond of music. He loved singing. He loved writing lyrics. People said he had a beautiful voice. Sometimes he would sing at weddings, at funerals, at church events. Despite what happened to him, Stephen would grow up to be a loving person. He was a reliable friend. He was devoted to others. He was hardworking. He was very happy and he had a bubbly personality. Everybody was sort of drawn to him. Everybody enjoyed being around him. As a young adult, he joined the Latter-day Saints Church, also known as Mormon Church, and he was so involved in the church that in his early 20s, he joined a two-year mission trip to Argentina. When he came back, he met Terica at church and they started dating in 1973. They got married about a year later. He was 24, she was 18. They have their first child, Jennifer, in 1974, then Josh in 1976, John and Michael in 77 and 82, and their youngest daughter, Elena, was born in 1985. During the first years of marriage, Stephen is a devoted husband. He's devoted to his wife, to his kids, to God. He goes to church with his wife. He works hard to provide for his family. Every week, they have a sort of family gathering at home where they talk about God and the church. But after only a couple years into their marriage, Terry started noticing changes in the behavior of her husband. The first thing that she noticed was his obsession for pornography. Interest that would soon become an obsession, but we'll get into that in a minute. Friends and family members also started noticing changes in Stephen's behavior. He became aggressive, he was narrow-minded, he always wanted to be right, especially with his family. It became impossible to have a conversation with him. He was always right, you were always wrong, you just couldn't have a different opinion. One day in 1984, he asks Terry, how about I get a second wife? This happened shortly after he became obsessed with a woman he met at church. Just FYI, this woman was married and she had kids, but I guess he didn't care. Terry even found in his journal how he felt about this other woman being married. He wrote, should anything happen to her husband, I want to marry her and raise her children. Imagine finding that in your husband's diary or your wife's diary. I mean, I guess it wasn't right that she read it, but she suspected that something was going on. She had suspected that something was off since the pretty much the beginning of their marriage. Reading someone's diary at the time, I feel like it's kind of like checking someone's phone today if you suspect they're cheating. I'm not saying it's okay. I don't think it is. 
but I'm just saying some people just do that. Steven's obsession for porn grew with time, kind of like a plant that you water. It just grew and grew and grew. I'm gonna say porn so much in this video that I know it's never gonna be monetized, but it's alright. So his obsession grew so much that he got to a point where he was okay sharing this kind of content with his kids. It started with him reading them books about sexual intercourse when they were six years old. I mean, yes, I am not a parent, but I don't think six years old is old enough, especially when it comes from someone like that. It evolved to Stephen teaching them about birth control when they were nine years old, which again, I don't think is okay, but he would tell them things like, people are just like animals. We should be able to have sex with anyone anytime we please. One day, Jennifer, his older daughter, she was about 10, 12 years old. She went on a business trip with her dad. They got a motel for the night. Steven turned on the TV and it was porn. I don't know if he was looking for it, you know, like if he was going through the channels and looking for it, or if it's just the first thing that you know, appeared on screen when he turned it on, but it was porn and he started watching it with his daughter, not asleep yet, in the adjacent bed. One day, another day, Jennifer went on another business trip with dad. Yeah, things seem to happen when they go on business trips. This time Josh was there too. I don't know how old they were, but they were pretty young. Everybody was at the hotel swimming pool and Jennifer remembers that she surprised Josh around a corner with a girl. She was four years old and she was no longer wearing a swimsuit. Jennifer would later say in an interview that it was her dad's obsession for porn that broke down her family. Seeing how things were getting worse and worse, especially after Stephen left the church, because eventually he did, Terry filed for divorce in 1992. And the least we can say is that it was an ugly divorce. Terry spoke about how her husband changed over the years, not just with her, but also with the kids. She said he was very manipulative. He kept trying to, oh my God, she said he was very manipulative and he kept trying to undermine her in front of the kids. He would mock her, he would insult her. He did everything to turn them against their mother, especially during the divorce proceedings. She explained that he was an awful father. Sometimes he would turn a blind eye to some of the things the kids would do when they needed to be told off or at least spoken to. But for the smallest things and very randomly, he would just get so mad. He would scream, he would call them names and he would spank them too harshly. I mean, harshly, not harshly, don't spank your kids. It doesn't do any good. Stephen would actually admit it himself in his diary. He wrote about how Josh was getting taller and stronger and he just couldn't spank him anymore. Josh was more difficult than his siblings, but spanking him when he was young did not help at all. And Josh being difficult was the reason why Stephen would target him more than the other kids. Terry believes that this illogical behavior of letting them do whatever they want and then discipline them over insignificant things, it caused their kids to be governed by their emotions rather than logic and common sense. They didn't know right from wrong. I mean, how could they? And you combine this with the disrespect that Stephen was showing to his wife day in and day out, you get kids who question authority all the time and who will grow up with severe issues. Terry even said that it got so bad she became afraid of her own sons. She was already afraid of Stephen, but the kids started to display the same behavior as their dad. They were becoming more aggressive and more violent, and they were also disrespectful with her. One of the boys pushed her once and hit her. I think it was Michael. When he was a teenager, Josh one day was asked to do the dishes by his mother. He took a knife, he pointed it towards her, and he said, don't push it, mom. If I had done that to one of my parents, I would not be here today. One day when Terry dared telling her son that he should respect her because she's his mother, he said, what have you done to earn my respect? You have to earn it, he said. Still during the divorce proceedings, Terry mentioned her husband's past. She believed he needed help to deal with issues that were from the past. The kidnapping, the year that he spent away from his mother thinking that he would never see her again, that actually lasted an entire year. Of course, she also mentioned his obsession for porn, polygamy, the fact that he wanted to marry a second wife. And she also mentioned something very disturbing. I mean, everything was disturbing. But she talked about how one day she surprised Josh and Michael in a bedroom in their home examining their baby sister Alina. When you have a father that tells you that you're an animal and you should be able to have sex with whomever you want, whenever you want, 
that kind of stuff happens, I guess. Naturally, religion also became a problem because, as I said, Stephen had left the church and Terry was convinced that it was because of porn. She said it made him gradually lose faith. He became an awful person. It just corrupted him. Funnily enough, Stephen also had something to say about his wife's faith. He said he had a problem with the fact that she was mixing New Age beliefs with Mormon beliefs. I mean, you would think he doesn't care because he left the church, so what does it matter how she believes, what she believes? Well, he simply said that she was a witch and she worshipped the devil and I guess he doesn't like witches. From everything I read about Stephen and Terry and the divorce, it felt like it was Terry who had more evidence, so to speak, against him. And it wasn't just her saying those things, it was also friends and family members and even Stephen's own grandmother she testified and she said that she witnessed her own son, grandson, uh, so Stephen, teaching his kids how to disrespect their mother simply by just disrespecting her. He wasn't actually teaching them, but he was showing them how. So that's what they started doing themselves. Terry got custody of Jennifer, Alina and Michael. Josh and John were given the choice to stay with mom or dad. Stephen refused to pay child support, which... I guess doesn't surprise anybody. He actually asked Terry to pay him child support because eventually all the kids ended up staying with him, going to stay with him, except Jennifer. He was making more money, much more than Terry. He actually didn't need it. He was just being petty. Terry was actually struggling so much that she had to ask help from the church sometimes. This whole time that they were in the divorce proceedings, Stephen was just bitter, he was just angry that she left him and he was just being petty. Everything he did was to mess with her, asking for child support. Sometimes he would go pick up the kids when it was not his turn to have them over. There was this one time when he kept Michael at his house when he was supposed to be staying with his mother and Terry knowing her husband's past, she did wonder if he'd be capable of well, kidnapping their son, kidnapping their children, just like he was kidnapped when he was a kid. Okay, now let's move on to Josh. You remember he was born in 1976 in Washington state. And as I said, he grew up with parents who had strong faith, at least until a certain point when it comes to Stephen. His father had left the congregation, but initially he did it in secret. He wrote about it in his diary, in his journal, but he did not share it with his family. So Josh and his siblings grew up as practicing Mormons. And as we now know, Josh's childhood was... <laughs> what's, what's a word that you could use to describe it? I don't even know. Crazy, troubled. I mean, he grew up with a father who would give him porn magazines when he was a kid. He saw his mother being called names, being abused physically and verbally. So we can only imagine how it shaped the way he viewed women from that, from seeing his mother being put down all the time. His father did his best to turn the kids against their mother even before the divorce. And he would also turn the boys against the girls. Jennifer, the older sister, would later say in an interview that sometimes her brothers would slap her and punch her. And on some occasions, it was on their dad's orders. She also said the house was divided, the boys on one side, the girls on the other. Sometimes Josh would call his sister a witch, just like dad would do with mom. When he was a teenager, Josh killed one of his sister's pets. When he was 13, 14 years old, he attempted suicide by hanging. He still had rope burns on his neck. He went to therapy for a while, and from what I gathered, it was mostly because of the suicide attempt, but apparently it was also for other self-destructive behaviors. Josh wrote a lot about everything. He had a diary like his dad. He also did voice recordings because I guess it's faster than writing. He would write or talk about a lot of things, but he would also hide a lot of things. He never mentioned the animals that he killed or his suicide attempt. After the divorce, he was given the choice to either live with his mother or his father. And his mother was like, listen, if you want to stay with me, you're more than welcome, but you're going to have to follow some rules curfew, 9 p.m., no swearing, no cursing, be respectful, no rated R movies. We all know where he got this interest for, 
this kind of content. Given the atmosphere Josh grew up in, he refused his mother's regained authority and he decided to stay with his father. Around that time, Josh would write how he hated his mother and he wanted her dead. Their dad did a really great job turning them against her, especially with Josh. After Josh spent some time under his father's roof, he sort of began to realize that he was the problem. They would often butt heads and in reality the fact that Josh refused authority which came from his father's education, if we can call it an education, it had spread. It was not just limited to his mother or school, it extended to his father as well. Josh would soon have a spiritual awakening. He would become more involved in church activities and his faith grew and plot twist he grew closer to his mother. He realized that it was his father's behavior that was abnormal, to say the least. And Josh didn't like the fact that his dad was now openly against the LDS church. He didn't understand that his father had lost faith. It's not just the fact that he lost it, it's also the fact that they argued all the time about LDS church and Stephen would attack Josh all the time about it, about his faith. Which makes it surprising that one day Stephen told Josh that he should marry a Mormon wife because she would be easier to manipulate, whatever that means. So you remember that Stephen himself met his wife through church and also that other woman he became obsessed with, he met her at church. So obviously the first woman Josh falls in love with, he meets her you guessed it, at the church. You should also know that among Mormons, they highly encourage encounters between single people. They even have dedicated branches or wards. They call them singles wards. These places are kind of like normal churches for single people so they can meet and get married and have kids. This spiritual awakening was very meaningful for Josh. He questioned a lot of things. He started with his father's anger, his aggressiveness, his violence, the difficult relationship between Stephen and Terry, and the fact that now nobody could tolerate Stephen and Josh didn't want to be like him. He examined himself, he thought about his own personality, he also wondered why he had trouble finding a girlfriend and also why he had issues socializing with others. He decided to change whatever he could change about himself to become a better person. He did not want to become like his father. He got more involved in church life and church activities. He got closer to his mother, but also to extended family members like uncles and cousins. He just wanted to be a better person. He wanted to have better relationships with his family members, but with everybody really. He just wanted to be liked. Josh met Catherine, the first woman he ever loved, at church shortly after he moved to Seattle in 1998. She was 19 years old, he was 21, 22, and Catherine described him as being very gentle, very loving, very affectionate, but at times he would get so mad, so angry, again like his father. The couple moved in together quickly and at first they were staying with Stephen because they were students, they couldn't afford their own place, and eventually they ended up getting their own apartment. Josh became very jealous, very possessive. He controlled Catherine's every move, so much so that one day her uncle passed away and she wanted to go back to Utah to attend the funeral because she was from, Catherine is from Utah. Josh just didn't want to let her go, so she, she didn't go. When Catherine wanted to go to college, she couldn't afford it, so Josh suggested that she takes a student loan. She got a loan from the bank, but it was Josh who cashed the check and Catherine never saw the money. Apparently to this day, she never repaid that debt. When Stephen offered to hire them at the company he owned, they agreed and again, it was Josh cashing Catherine's checks. I think it would be pointless to try and get into the debate of why some women stay in abusive relationships, whether it be it like Josh, you know, controlling everything or even worse relationships than that, you know, with violence and stuff like that. It is a very complex question, so please be mindful in the comments because some people who read this may be in that situation or have been in this situation in the past. The one thing that would eventually give Catherine the courage to end the relationship, I mean, it was a combination of things, but that one thing was the icing on the cake. One day he told her that he didn't want to get married and he didn't want to have children, which for someone who's a practicing Mormon was very surprising to Catherine. For such a devout Mormon, it's not something that she expected. She was already feeling guilty 
being under the same roof without being married and now she just felt like the relationship was not gonna go anywhere so one day she took the opportunity of a trip that she had planned to visit her parents in utah she called josh and broke up with him over the phone and she decided she was never coming back to seattle for a whole year catherine was a prisoner in this relationship and she finally found the courage to end it and regain control of her life catherine's story is very important for what's coming next. Before we get to Susan, there's one last important thing I want to say about Josh when it came to approaching a woman that he fancied. He had no problem at all. He was not shy. He was very confident, but he was super awkward. He's very pushy and he chases women who don't want him. When he has a crush on someone, it quickly turns into an obsession, just like his father. He will buy roses and he will say, I love you, just like that. And that's his idea of courtship. That's generally how he thinks you get a girl. In 1999, he met a young woman. He fell in love after like three seconds. He tried to seduce her with his signature blend of harassment and stalking. He would look for excuses to see her and go to her house. And when she finally made it very clear that she was not interested, he started chasing her sister. And when her sister was not interested, he went after their cousin. And remember that because it will come back soon, seducing other family members. In his diary, he wrote how it seems like women don't like it when you insist. You don't say. It's funny how some guys just think that no means yes or no means keep trying until I say yes. Not everybody, yes, but, but sometimes it happens. Josh meets Susan at church. I mean, just like dad, that's where he picks them up. Susan Cox was born on October 6, 1981 in New Mexico. Her family moved to Alaska for a short time before settling in Washington state. She is the third of four daughters, children of Charles and Judy Cox. Susan is very religious. Her faith in God is strong. Her spirituality is strong. And just like Josh, she's very involved in the life of the church. Susan is also very stylish. She loves to pamper herself. She loves to take care of herself, like doing her hair and makeup, stuff like that. And she also loves taking care of others. So much so that she becomes a beautician because as everybody who knows her says, she enjoys making people look beautiful. She's barely out of cosmetology school when she meets Josh and she tells him that she's met him before. He has no memory of it at all, but she remembers that when she was 12, he came to her house to play the piano. At the time, he had a crush on her older sister, Mary. Crush that was not reciprocated. Classic for Josh, who probably was used to it by now. Susan, on the other hand, she's under his spell. She sees Josh as a handsome, ambitious man who wants to become an architect. He has a motorbike. He has his own apartment. He seems to be quite mature he has his head on his shoulders and he's a mormon too which is very important for susan she could not have asked for a better man josh quickly falls in love with her one evening josh had friends over at his apartment for dinner something that he does often even though technically he cannot afford it he's in debt but that evening susan was gonna be there she had been invited so he really didn't care about the money at some point he gets up and he goes to wash the dishes and he's asking for some help she volunteers, and as they're chatting in front of the sink, they exchange their first kiss. Susan would later say, in that moment, she knew he was the one she knew that she was going to marry him. But Josh's interest in her seems self-centered. In his voice recorder, you can hear him say, I think that she's incredibly beautiful, and a lot of that is because of the way she treats me, the way she takes care of me and my house. She'll start doing the dishes or dust something, it's important for me to have someone who takes care of me and my stuff and our space together. Would he have loved her so much if she didn't do the dishes? Of course, Susan cares about his well-being. She's fallen in love and she's also very generous with him. She helps him financially since unlike him, she's not in debt. She's got clean credit. Susan works hard to make her dreams come true. She works long hours. She has long days, which might be another reason why Josh loved her so much clean credit. About two months into their relationship, Josh comes to see her one day at Jesse Penny, where she works. He tells her that he wants to buy a ring for his mother with her employee discount. And he's asking Susan for help in choosing a nice ring. This ring that she will pick is actually going to be her engagement ring, bought with her employee discount. One evening in his apartment, he surprises her with roses, with romantic music, he asks her to read a verse from the Bible. 
he gets down on one knee and he asks her, will you marry me? And she whispers, yes. Their friends and family are taken by surprise, especially Susan's family. They don't think it's a good idea. They haven't known each other long enough. They've only been dating for about two months. Susan's parents are worried, but they know if they tell her to not get married, she'll probably want it even more. It could have the opposite effect. So instead, they give themselves some time and they decide to see the bright side of things. He has a job. He has his own apartment. He seems smart. She looks happy. It seems like she loves him. So maybe it's not such a bad thing after all. For some reason, Josh is in a hurry. He wants to get married as soon as possible. Susan wants to be engaged for a few months. She wants to wait, but he just can't wait to marry her. It's just as if his relationship with Catherine had taught him this one lesson trap her before she escapes. On April 6, 2001, they get married and Josh is late to his own wedding. During the religious ceremony, Stephen is not present since he left the congregation, so he's not allowed in the temple, but everybody's going to be there for the reception. Josh confides in his journal that the love he and Susan have for each other is eternal. It is different from the other couples. Their friendship, their love is very deep. They communicate like no one else. Other couples are just not like them. They are unique. I'm sure every couple says that right after they get married. The couple lives in Josh's apartment during the first few months of their marriage and Stephen visits them too often. He starts to develop an obsession for Susan. He writes in his journal that he told a friend about this love that he feels for her and that friend told him, if you do anything about it, it's gonna destroy your family. After a few months, Josh and Susan talk about the fact that they want to buy a house. Since they cannot afford it, Stephen offers his help. They can move in with him so they can save some money and most importantly, Stephen wants to have Susan under his roof. The couple accepts this generous offer even though Michael and John are also living with Stephen, which means that the couple is not going to have much privacy. But they're willing to make that sacrifice so they can afford to buy their own house. Stephen takes advantage of Susan's naivete to film her with his camera. This camera was sort of an extension of his arm. He was carrying it everywhere he went. Because of him, because of his obsession with this camera, there is so much footage of the Powell family. So he films Susan a lot, often without her knowing. Sometimes she knows about it, but she doesn't say anything simply because she sees nothing wrong with it. She only sees it as Stephen being obsessed with his new toy and he takes it wherever he goes. In a sort of subtle way, which was actually not subtle at all, Stephen tries to break up Josh and Susan. He will tell her things like, you know, the futon that you guys were using at Josh's apartment. It actually was Catherine's, like they were using it when he was with her. One evening, Stephen is driving Susan and it's just the both of them in the car. He had his camera and he was filming at some point and then he forgot to turn it off. Their conversation is recorded. Susan is heard telling him that she and Josh are moving to Colorado. Washington, Colorado. It's pretty far. So Stephen was not happy about that. He finally found the courage to tell her how he felt about her. And he was so obsessed with her that he was certain that she felt the same way, that she loved him back in secret. I also had the feeling that this Colorado move announcement, he kind of saw it as Susan telling him, okay, I secretly love you. You secretly love me. Now is the time to say something. Don't let me go. When in fact, it was actually the opposite. She felt so uncomfortable with his behavior that she wanted to leave. At first, Stephen doesn't see it like that. He really thinks she likes him. He tells her about that one time when he was rubbing her feet and he was aroused and he thought she was aroused. Clearly it was all in his head and she tells him, I'm your daughter-in-law. I'm married to your son. Like what the hell are you doing? She also told him that she does not like when he greets her with a kiss on the forehead because he got into the habit of doing that. I know a kiss on the forehead sounds innocent, but when you know the person doing that, is not innocent. You can just sense it. You can feel it. She told him, my father isn't as affectionate as you are with me. It's inappropriate. Just stop it. That's when Steven starts to panic and he's asking her, are you going to tell Josh about it? Is there anything I don't talk to Josh about? She says, Steven tries to get ahead of it. So he tells Josh himself. He says that it was Susan flirting with him. He's just a man. He was just reacting to her provocations. Okay. 
In December 2003, Susan and Josh move from Washington State to Utah. They stay with Jennifer and her family. They both find a job and they start looking for a house. Jennifer would later say that that's when she saw Josh being very controlling with Susan, just like he had been with Catherine. But Susan was sort of starting to fight back. She was standing up for herself. Around that same time is when Josh started losing his faith just like daddy. I know this is frustrating. This is probably already a long video, but I'm going to have to stop here. And part two is coming up next week on Sunday at 6 p.m. French time. So depending on where you are, I don't know what time it's going to be. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and share. I feel like I'm starting all over again because I separated both channels. And yeah, I know it's my mistake. I should have done it from the beginning, but I don't know. Share if you've enjoyed this video. That's it for me, and I'll see you next week. Bye.